Governor Zulum says we have two choices, war or accept repentance, terrorists. And former Speaker of the House of Representatives, Dali Umar uh, Akbar, says the third force being promoted to major political parties in 2023 will not fly. This is Plus Politics, and I am Mary Anna Cole. Baba Ghana Zulum, governor of Zamfara State, has uh, said uh, he is in a difficult situation, the reintegration of repentant um, Boko Haram members. He said the choice between um, to cautiously accept the insurgents. Uh, he added that accepting repentant insurgents had the risk of offending the feelings of victims, lead to, to rebellion, adding that there, the risk of insurgents returning to ways or uh, their ways uh, if they are rejected. Now, he's obviously talking about being in between a rock and a hard place, but we're going to be discussing it uh, from a security perspective. And joining us right now is Dixon Osage. He is uh, a security expert. Thank you very much, Dixon, for joining us. It's my pleasure. Thank you for having me. Um, this story, obviously, has been making the news, uh, making the rounds for a couple of days now. And the first thing that Nigerians obviously are wondering is, um, why do we have to even be in this situation in the first place? I would like to take your mind back to the first time when the so-called repentant um, Boko Haram members submitted themselves. They were holding up placards um, asking that Nigerians forgive them. I, I remember drilling um, one of the security persons we had here about um, you know, the questions that were raised. These are people who said they do not believe in Western education, but the English on the placards were very you know, very, very good. Um, and who's, who knows exactly what the plan of these people are? Are they really repentant? And Dixon, I'm asking because the army had recruited and there had been some form of amnesty program and reintegration program for um, certain um, repentant former Boko Haram members who the army even said had some of them had gone back to Boko Haram, taking information to these people. So why are we doing it again? What, whatever happened to once bitten, twice shy? Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mary Han, and uh, nice being here. Uh, I think uh, the Nigerian military has not learned uh, its lessons uh, because uh, I am not against uh, surrendering or uh, some group of criminal elements, national criminals and international criminals, you know, bringing their arms to order. Uh, sometimes we must be very careful, you know, uh, not to accept uh, sur uh, surrendering as a form of defeat, uh, because uh, surrendering could be a deception uh, in the battlefield, you know. When your enemy overpowers you, uh, when the bombardments are, are very tedious and very heavy from the Air Force wing and the military artillery and armor bombardments are uh, hitting hard on these terrorists, uh, they have no option than to surrender. So for us, first of all, we need to understand uh, uh, the methodology in which they surrendered uh, to the Nigerian uh, states. Uh, like you rightly said, uh, these guys, uh, they do not believe in uh, Western education. And uh, the writings on the placards are very, very clean, loud and clear, and very readable. Uh, I think uh, the Nigerian government, the state of Borono, must be very careful. Uh, because when we talk about surrendering, surrendering uh, is another deceptive uh, uh, methodology from the criminal wing, you know. Uh, for example, when you look into the uh, 48 laws of powers, uh, law 22 uh, tells us that uh, we should be very careful about surrendering. Surrendering does not mean uh, the military have won the war or uh, taken victory. Surrendering does not mean the enemy has been beaten. Um, Dixon, are you still there? I think that um, uh, your connection um, has frozen. But can you hear me? Oh, I can hear you. All right, go ahead. Yeah, so sometimes we must be very careful about surrendering because surrendering uh, definitely could be deceptive. So for us to succeed, uh, apologies. Uh, I think that your connection again has frozen. Um, but I'm curious if you can hear me. A hundred of these members of the insurgent group have surrendered in the past months, and their families. These people came with families. I, I and one of the one of the notable persons among these people who surrendered 
is one of the girls from the school that was kidnapped years ago. She returned with two children and a man who obviously is a member of, you know, the insurgents um, and who she referred to as her husband. Now, I mean, I, I know that the average person is not supposed to be asking about tactics or, you know, certain information that the army has. Uh, but if we have had so many of these people continuously re, re show up and say that they're surrendering, why is it taking so long for us to, and, and I say us as Nigeria, the army, to find where the others are? Why is it so difficult for us to extract information from these guys to help the army to continue to win the war and have the upper hand? I mean, what I think uh, is very difficult uh, is because uh, we are not following the process of uh, disarmament and surrendering. Uh, that is where the administration of the justice system comes to play. That is the uh, uh, CGS. CJS. Uh, the administration of criminal justice begins with the police, the court, and the police. Most of these guys that have surrendered, I, I would definitely recommend that uh, the government uh, must have them reprimanded uh, because uh, they can't just come and surrender. Uh, are free of charge after killing Nigerians, sending many people uh, to the graveyard and, uh, uh, you know, putting the state of Nigeria at mess from the international ranking. So for me, uh, I will advise that uh, even if they're they going to surrender, uh, they must be uh, punished for their crime because if they're not punished, then uh, the government of Nigeria uh, will be satisfying uh, criminality. And when you satisfy crime, then everyone uh, from all nooks and crannies uh, will be, uh, you know, confident that Nigeria is a place where you can come uh, commit crime and uh, surrender. Uh, surrendering is, can be deceptive, like I rightly say. So we must be very careful about those guys surrendering. What are their plans? Uh, do they have a plan B? Do they want to strike back? Do they want to come back and uh, gather more information against the state of Nigeria and strike back? So uh, I would advise the federal government to be very, very diplomatic. And the military must go all out uh, to engage these guys uh, from their hideouts. Because uh, if we don't go all out, I would look at it as a form of friendly match. Uh, because the Nigerian military is too big, you know, to be held uh, hostage for the past 12 years by these criminal elements. Well, joining us again um, is um, Ambassador Roy Ohidibe. Um, Ambassador Roy, you, all, you obviously are very um, acquainted with this story um, uh, and what Governor Zulum is talking about. Help us to paint a picture. When he says uh, he's in a difficult situation uh, and he makes reference to the fact that it's either they receive these people back into society or we will risk an endless war. What exactly do you think he means? Well, um, thank you for the opportunity and um, thank you for having my brother also on set. You see, one thing that um, these guys are just making statements, they are making uninformed statements. Now, if we have numbers of persons that submit themselves that were ascribed to be terrorists and have been in active service as terrorist groups, then they are not a problem for the army anymore. The military should not be seen taking pictures with them, giving them food, water, and clothing. All those are just semantics of um, politics. Now, the first thing to do is to hand them over to the DSS and the police. And the DSS and the police would begin to separate those that were in active service, those that would claim that they were forced into terrorism. There are those that would say, my village work was captured and um, I joined as a child, so I don't know what I'm doing. And, you know, you begin to separate all of these people, and they should be in incarceration. They should be within the confines of a correctional center in Nigeria. And once they are taken in like that, we are set. We are not going to do extrajudicial killing. We are not going to begin to torture you inhumanely. But the law must take its course to serve as a deterrent. All of this de-radicalization process that they are pampering them to resettle within the forest region would not be allowed. They should be seen within the confines of a correctional center as detainees. And the security agencies should penetrate them with our mold and begin to find out what roles they play 
and who are those still at large? Mm. Because if you don't do that, you will not be able to ascribe penalties. And if you don't ascribe penalties, you have not served as Maybe. a deterrent for others. Maybe. Okay. All right. Well, let, let me continue with you, uh, Ambassador Roy. Uh, again, back to what the governor, Zulum, uh, said again. He talked about the fact that um, if we do not accept these insurgents, this repentant insurgents, um, they, would, they might go back and be re-radicalized. Uh, re in other words, they would join other uh, insurgents. Now, he also says that accepting them into the society means that you're going to hurt the feelings of people who have been victims of these insurgents. But I'm really wondering why the governor should be the one making this decision. Should he be the one making this decision? Should this be a civilian's decision? And I'm not saying or trying to water down the duty or the job of a governor in this regard, but this is a high-level security um, issue. It's an insurgent. People are dying. Uh, should the governor be the one who has to say, like you have said, we should have the DSS, the police, uh, the army at some point will wash his hands off it, but should the governor be the one deciding all of this, being that this is a guerrilla warfare and these are people who have been termed as killers, terrorists? Should we be actually allowing the governor to debate this or try to decide what should happen? Okay, well, um, you see, a governor of a state is the chief security officer of the state. But that does not mean that in such um, terrorist um, situations, it has become a national issue. And those people should be handed over directly to government security agencies that should handle processing them before the law. So I don't think that is a governor's place, but you know that um, everything is tapering towards 2023. And you should uh, agree with me that there must have been some covert discussions before you can have a volume of people coming out to submit themselves. They must have tried their waters, they must have discussed covertly with certain persons and trying to find a soft landing. So if the governor had a discussion, I think he should forward this discussion for any kind of soft landing towards the judicial process that will be set up. And you know, terrorism has been going on for years in Nigeria. So why haven't we found alternative judicial channels for those that submit themselves? Pass it through the National Assembly, pass it through the Senate, and let it be endorsed. It can't be now that they are submitting themselves and you are now working towards a soft landing. If they go so, back... Uh, Ambassador Roy, I'm sorry to talk, talk over... I'm, I'm so feet. sorry. I apologize for talking over you, but are you insinuating that um, all of this is uh, a mere political gimmick because someone wants to get votes in 2023? Is this what you're implying? In every intelligent security practitioner in this country and global intelligence terrorism watchers, we have seen the, the challenge of politics and security. And we have yet been able to separate it. Okay, if you have people submitting themselves before now, and those people were taking through the radicalization process, why do you need to make this a, a, what is the noise about for this set of people that are also submitting themselves? If you have a de-radicalization process going on already, if even we have been speaking against it, we have said that the de-radicalization process is not firm enough. It's not separating the crime from the criminal. So if you have this set of people, what is the business of the governor? What is the business of this media hype? Why are these people not also channeled through the existing radicalization process? So <laughs> I don't want to believe everything our politicians do. Because if you count the number of people that die in Nigeria every day, even these criminals that are terrorists, they break away and become bandits. 
They are kidnapping in Kaduna, they are kidnapping in Ondo, they are kidnapping in Polakos, Bayesa, Enugu, Kano, Sokoto, even the MI. They are saying that they are going to come against them strongly. In Plateau State, every Northerner is against this menace. Okay. So what is the media hype if it is not policy? Uh, I'm coming back to you now, Dixon. Um, of course, I know you want to comment on this, but let me also speak on a couple of things, uh, pick on a couple of things that Governor Zulum also said. Uh, he said we have to choose between an endless war or cautiously accept the surrender terrorist, which is really painful and difficult for anyone that has lost loved ones. Uh, difficult for all, all of us, he said. And even the military whose colleagues have died and volunteers, he said. So let's put in context these people. Let's take into consideration the, um, the soldiers, the victims, the people of Zamfara whose lives have been distorted. Uh, they have been discomforted. Some of them have lost homes. They've lost family members. Even volunteers who've been killed, whether they work, worked for aid, um, um, NGOs, and all of that. It's, it's a potpourri of people and issues. Let's take into consideration all of these things. Where do you even start to deal with this issue? Because you have to consider all of these people, all parties involved. Where should we start to deal with this issue? And again, do you agree with Ambassador Roy that this is a ploy for 2023 to make a person, a politician or whoever it is, to look good? Um, I think we lost Dixon. If we are going to have to reintegrate these people back into society or even accept them in the first instance, um, I forgot to raise the issue of the fact that the man who showed himself as the husband to one of the girls who returned with her kids, um, what is going to be done as to the fact that this girl left here as a child, but then returns as a married person? And this man obviously is not a child. So we're talking about issues of child molestation here. And of course, the terrorist, for that matter, who has made her um, a mother at her age. So that is on one side. There are people who have lost their livelihoods, their lost family members, their soldiers who have lost their friends in battle. How do you address all of these issues and still try to win a war against insurgency with all concern? Let's not also forget that the president has reflected on what's happening in Afghanistan. He's brought his fears to play. Um, talking about, you know, what's happening in the Sahel and what's happening in Nigeria and the fears that this might, this should not, in fact, he was not hoping that it would be, but he was afraid that if we do not deal with it, it might become an Afghanistan problem. So Dixon, where do we start to address this issue of all the parties concerned before we even start talking about the deterioration of the issue? All right, Marianne, thank you very much for having me. Uh, you see, uh, sometimes uh, we just look at the state of insecurity in Nigeria uh, from a discretionary perspective. Discretionary perspective in the sense that uh, we don't uh, uh, tend to uh, look at uh, the Nigerian state. We don't tend to look at uh, our, our people, our citizens. Uh, we've lost a lot of soldiers uh, over the past six years. We've lost a lot of uh, uh, brothers and sisters in the battlefield. And uh, <laughs> these guys, actually, they can just come on air. Uh, to surrender their weapon, uh, who has attained their true repentance, uh, who has attained their, uh, the truthfulness of their uh, surrendering. Uh, because for me, I think that uh, it is very essential that the Nigerian government must look into the administration of criminal justice system. It's not in the powers of the governor to pardon these guys. Uh, they've committed a crime against the state, a crime against the federation, and also an international crime. So people like that must be you know, sent to prison. They must, go, they must be reprimanded. Uh, let me say for one or two years, then uh, carry out a psychological evaluation uh, for us to believe uh, that they are truly uh, repented. If they don't do that, uh, the fighters, our soldiers, uh, their morale will be dissipated. Uh, they will be highly demoralized. That these are the guys that kill our brothers and sisters. Uh, they are now uh, being forgiven so uh, quickly. So we must be very careful not to tread on the part of uh, 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 demoralizing our troops. Uh, for me, I don't think they are truly repented. I think uh, it's a deceptive mode. Uh, for them to go back and return, because the surrendering uh, is not a form of defeat uh, from either side. Surrendering could be tactical, and uh, they might have a game plan. Going by what you just said about Afghanistan, yes, uh, uh, the problem is worrisome. 
that to tell you that uh, Afghanistan perhaps will be a safe haven for most of these uh, uh, criminal elements. So it is right time for Nigeria to tighten up our national borders and engage this uh, war. Take it as a full-blown war because uh, we're not taking it as a full-blown war. We're just taking this war as a discretionary war. It's not a discretionary war. It must be a full-blown war uh, because uh, you could see that most of these guys, they're bringing down our fighters' jets, bringing down our soldiers, bringing down our military. They've tested the integrity of our military. They've tested the integrity of our defense. They've tested our national powers. So uh, the Nigerian government must buckle up and seek advice from security professionals if, uh, for the, uh, the way to go about this repented or surrendering uh, criminal elements. Ambassador Roy, if, if we were to go by what the governor has said, that it's, he's obviously in a tight place, he does not know what to do and he cannot do one without the other. Who's to say that these people will not take advantage of the fact that, oh, well, the government um, pardoned this, the first group, they closed them, they you know, rehabilitated them, even though some of them returned. Um, and who's to say that we're not going to have more people take advantage of this, kill people, do whatever they like, and then come back and say Nigerians were sorry, and we take them in? Um, so where is the place of making sure that justice is served? Just like Ostaje said, where is the place of the justice system? Can we even trust that that process um, will be free, fair, and will bring justice to and some, some, of, form, some form of solace uh, to those who have been victims of this endless war. I mean, Boko Haram insurgents has taken over a decade and many people have died. I, I mean, the, 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 the statistics I cannot get exactly right now off the top of my head, but who's to, who's to say that if we go the way that the governor wants to go, these people will not take advantage of it? Advantage of it. <laughs> Let me tell you something. You know, um, every country has its check and balances. Now, for our executives, the apex of our leadership is the presidency. Now, the presidency has its check and balances. One of its check and balances is the federal constitution. We have a constitution in this country. And, you know, we have the judiciary to always be there to monitor compliance to that constitution. And the judiciary has the agency to, to help it to arrest persons, group of people, even government personnel that violate the constitution. So what our political system first sought to do was to intimidate and destabilize the Nigerian check and balances institution. So the, the judiciary became toothless, the Senate and the House of Reps, they became a house of uh, commotion. The other agencies, they lost touch with the current dynamics of international investigation. And, um, and, and before you know what's happening, God fatalism, violations, distortions has just taken place. Anarchy is the name of what is happening right now in Nigeria. Because if you look at the um, selection of heads of agencies, if you look at the opportunities of the judiciary to actually implement penalties against the forces, where are all the people that have been paraded for the banditry, terrorism, murder, even Evans the kidnapper? Madume was arrested, soldiers and policemen embarrassed themselves by engaging in discord and killing themselves. The army was intimidating the police, the police was arresting military men, and today, the Madume case is still a quagmire, is still a menace in the judicial system. Do you think that people don't understand right now that the check and balancing system in Nigeria has been distorted? That is why the, the international community will be asking to adjudicate cases outside of Nigeria. Because if they say, um, put these cases before your country, it will become a problem of what ethnic group do you belong to, what political party do you belong to, what religion do you belong to. Even in Islam, 
there is division. Even in Christianity, in Nigeria, so there, there is division. So everybody is just at the beck and call of a distorted presidential system. So it's a major issue that we face. And we hope that in the next institution of governance, who our eyes will be clear enough to begin to pick wisely. Okay. Well, because we're out of time, I want to say thank you, Dixon Osage and Ambassador Roy Okidibi are both uh, security experts. Thank you for speaking with us. We appreciate it. Thank you very much. It was a right. pleasure. All right, thank you all for staying with us. We'll take a short break. When we return, the Speaker of the House, or former Speaker of the House of Representatives, Gali Umna Naaba, says that the third force being promoted um, to oust the major political parties in the country come 2023 will be a flop. Stay with us. <laughs>